All right, I think 16 is going to be the magic number and we'll continue to roll through. So again, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, first ever uh, webinar series that uh, has been put on as a response to the public health crisis we're facing in higher education um, with transitioning to remote learning and new online virtual environments and trying to provide content and resources for instructors to be able to use in their courses and classroom as they, and like many of us, wrestle with what this new type of instruction looks like. Uh, this idea uh, was started on Twitter with just uh, a couple of individuals asking um, to go beyond a volunteer guest lecture sign up and to be able to kind of look through a database of individuals and see what pairings could be created to provide a variety of webinars on important topics in higher education. One of the things that I'll note is that if you look at the future forum information uh, with the URL right there, um, it provides information to all of the webinars we plan to host, as well as live, uh, I, as well as the recorded links for the webinars if you are not able to attend and you want to use in a classroom. The first one today is on higher education affordability and its impact on students. Uh, in a few weeks, we'll focus on internationalization and higher education. In April, we'll discuss topics around queer student success with research and practice. And the fourth one thus far that's planned is on critical policy analysis and advocacy in higher education. Before we move forward, we just want to get a little bit of context in terms of who's here. So I'm opening up a poll for all of us to be able to just share who's in attendance. And it allows for you to click multiple categories of the ones available. That's 70%, all right. Set that 80% threshold and we'll move on. One more, going once, going twice. And here are the results. Hopefully everyone can see them as well. We have, uh, wow, okay. 50% of those that uh, are viewing are researchers as well as a good sprinkling of students, instructors, practitioners and eight community members. So thank you all for being here. That gives us context in terms of our remarks and the ways that we shape the conversation. So thank you. All right, so our agenda today, I'll quickly go through the scholar profiles. Uh, I know everyone wants to get to our esteemed panelists and the remarks they have around affordability, financial aid and student debt. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have a panel discussion then allow for those of you that are attending to ask questions via the Q&A. So the question and answer is open throughout the webinar. So you are more than welcome to ask questions at any time and we will answer them. Today, I am lucky to be able to moderate and introduce our panelists. First, Dr. Elizabeth Bell at Miami University in Ohio. Dr. Dominique J. Baker at Southern Methodist University, and soon to be Dr. Leanna Hippolyte at the University of Southern California. And for those of you that uh, are following along in the last couple of weeks, uh, these are the articles that we provided as pre-reads. Again, if you look at the top right of your screen, there is a link for all of our information, our future webinars, uh, scholar profiles, as well as readings that have been downloaded and accessible to all to be able to read. I know sometimes, especially having community members and researchers here, the access to this knowledge that our panelists have generated is sometimes um, not available, but we are making that available. Please do not let the uh, journal outlets know though. And with that, we will move forward into individual remarks and it'll be in the order of Dr. Bell, Ileana Hippolyte and Dr. Baker. And if you'd like, you just let me know by saying uh, next slide and I'll advance the slides. Sounds good. Thank you so much for putting this together, Eric. Everyone can hear me okay, I assume. 
Yes. Okay. Awesome. So as uh, Eric said, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Bell. I'm an assistant professor over at Miami University, and I'm very excited today to talk to you about a couple of projects that I'm working on, on the politics of designing tuition-free college, specifically looking at how policy design and social constructions of target populations is going to shape public opinion. So you can go to the next slide. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly, though, about the college affordability crisis that we're facing right now that's going to be made even more difficult by the COVID-19 crisis. So when we look in the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen a 213% increase in tuition, and that's inflation adjusted. And at the same time, we've also seen serious declines in state appropriations. So when we look from 1970s all the way to the mid 2000s, state appropriations are down by around 30%. So we have less money coming in from the state and a lot of uh, universities have responded by increasing tuition rates. Now this leaves us with the college affordability crisis where students and families are shouldering more and more of the cost of college. And in fact, when we ask US public, 70% of parents uh, indicate that they're very concerned about how to finance their child's college education. So this is a really important issue and it's cross-cutting. Um, but we also know that we face huge student debt crisis as well. So we have 1.3 trillion in student debt right now. And we also know that that is unevenly distributed across different racial and ethnic groups in our country. So it's, it's affecting a ton of people. And in addition to that, it also has serious implications for uh, low income students and students of color who, who are the most impacted by this crisis. You can go to the next slide. So a lot of policymakers around the nation right now are talking about this policy solution, free college, tuition free college, also known as promise programs. So this map shows you this is the most recent estimate of where promise programs are. And right now we actually have 19 states with a statewide tuition free college program. And we also have around 300 different local cities or regions with free college programs. So you can just advance the slide a little bit. Um, and what's interesting here to, to all of us interested in equity and politics is really the variation in these free college programs in terms of design, right? So none of these programs are exactly the same. And these policy design questions are incredibly important because this shapes who gets what, when, and how, right? This also shapes whether free college is going to ultimately enhance equity or whether it can reinforce inequality. So next slide. Thank you, Eric. So the motivation for this project is really thinking about, you know, moving, um, moving this literature who's really focused on outcomes. So all of the, the promise literature is mainly focused on looking at, you know, what are the effects of free college on a variety of K-12 and higher education outcomes, which is incredibly important. Some of my work is doing that as well. But this work that I'm doing here that I'm gonna be presenting today is looking at politics and specifically thinking about how these political decisions are happening about who gets what, when, and how in these free college programs. So you can advance a couple of bullet points. And what I'm gonna to argue today is based in political science theory on social constructions of target populations, this policy design theory. And I'm gonna argue that that actually is going to shape public opinion, which is really a cornerstone of political feasibility. All around the nation right now, policymakers are talking about how they should design free college programs. And what they're doing is what's called anticipatory feedback. So they're thinking about what kind of free college programs are going to get me the most support at the ballot box, right? What kind of free college programs are going to elicit the public to have a positive response to the program? And so what I'm doing in this project is really thinking about how variation in policy design and target populations in particular are going to shape first support for tuition-free college. So what versions of tuition-free college are the most supported? That's really the first question. This is the, the paper that is already published that was provided to you. The second question that I think is really important and where I'm moving with my work is how does variation in policy design, how does variation in these target populations shape our willingness to add administrative burdens? So administrative burdens are all of the different eligibility requirements that students have to overcome in order to gain access to free college. So that's the second question that I'll be addressing today. 
so we can move forward. So the theoretical framework that I'm, I'm uh, using for, for this these st different studies is uh, policy design theory. And basically this theory in political science has been tested across all different policy domains. There's 111 empirical tests as of 2013. There's really more like 125 at this point. And what we find across all of these different studies is that policymakers actually, um, they are allocating benefits and burdens differently across different target populations. So if we think about this quadrant, um, these different quadrants, they vary along two different dimensions. The first is political power, and the second is social construction, so the level of deservingness. And what we find across all these studies is that target groups with high levels of political power and high levels of deservingness are more likely to get benefits, right? And then other, on the other side, target populations with lower levels of political power and lower levels of deservingness are less likely to get benefits and they're more likely to get burdens or they're more li likely to get symbolic benefits, which are benefits that have a ton of stipulations, right? That have a ton of administrative burdens that only allow the deserving poor, right? To access these programs. So that's one of the ways that we see policymakers responding to social constructions and overall what we find is a lot of um, studies looking at the elite level but uh, only around five studies have looked at public opinion so what i'm looking at in this this project is thinking about whether these decisions by political elites in this these disparities created by political elites also mirror what the mass publics actually want from our policies so we can go to the next slide. In terms of free college, so um, I'm, I'm actually, what I did is, is I collected a nationally representative survey sample of 2,800 respondents. I conducted a survey experiment where basic, the basics are, I just randomly assign four different versions of tuition free college to respondents. So respondents were in one of four different groups and they varied along two dimensions, just like the quadrants that you saw previously. So the first dimension is uh, whether it was a universal tuition-free college policy, whether it was open to all families regardless of family income, or whether it was only open to families making less than $50,000 a year. So the difference here is political power, right? So if we have a universal tuition-free college policy, this is targeting politically powerful groups like the middle, middle class and higher income families, in addition to low income students. But in a targeted policy, we only, the policy beneficiaries are only low income students. The second uh, element of the, the uh, variation comes from whether there's a merit requirement, whether there's a minimum high school GPA requirement, um, and, and whether that's included or not included. So those are the two different dimensions. And basically this creates four different groups. If you could go forward one, um, on the animation, that'd be awesome. Okay, perfect. So four groups, one is targeted merit-based, one is targeted with no merit requirement, and then universal, the same thing. So let's move on to the hypotheses. So connecting back to that theoretical framework, my hypotheses are first that respondents will be less likely to support tuition-free college when it includes only low-income families, rather than it being universal right? Because specifically middle class families and higher income families are not going to be in that target group. They will be less likely to support tuition free college, right? And if we think about again, connecting back to equity, there's a ton of implications of this. The second uh, hypothesis is that respondents will be more likely to support tuition free college when the target population must meet a minimum GPA requirement. And in the prompt, it's important to note, I do prime them to think about college material, like what students are college material or college ready. And we know that these social constructions also indicate deservingness, right? So I hypothesize that they'll be more likely actually to support those policies. And the opposite with burdens. All right, so the findings. So first for policy support, um, I find essentially support for both of the hypotheses that uh, respondents are more likely to support a policy that's universal, that is open to all families regardless of income. And in addition, they're also more likely to support tuition-free college when it incorporates a minimum GPA requirement. Keep in mind, these are randomly assigned target populations. And so this is a causal estimate, right? So we see higher levels of support, I apologize, 
if you can hear the dogs barking, <laughs> we see higher levels of support uh, in both of these conditions that I predicted based on deservingness and based on political power. And moving forward, what I'm working on right now is another article looking at administrative burdens. So I also ask respondents, what types of administrative burdens should we actually add to tuition-free college? These are all the different types. And if you could advance. So going back to those hypotheses, I actually find, again, respondents are more likely to support a higher level of burden whenever free college is targeted at families making less than $50,000 a year. That has serious implications. We know that administrative burden keeps people from accessing free college. So this is incredibly important for equity. Okay, good, thank you. I'm glad you can't hear the dog too much. Okay, so the second uh, hypothesis is also supported that um, respondents actually support significantly lower levels of burden when students have to meet the GPA requirement. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, so, so the takeaways here, first that the social constructions of target populations impact both the level of policy support for tuition-free college and also our willingness to add administrative burden to free college. And we know that that's really important because administrative burdens actually impact folks who have lower levels of social and political capital the most. So this actually enhances, or it reinforces inequality, right? So instead of enhancing equity, we could actually be undoing equity and contributing to more inequality in college access and affordability, and that's seriously problematic. I also wanted to mention that there's heterogeneous effects uh, across different people. So like depending on your ideology, your race, your income in the region, there are some different effects that I don't have time to get into because that is the 12 minute mark. Um, but also just, just finally, um, I really wanted to highlight the importance of potentially competing priorities between political feasibility, right? And politics and social equity. And the importance for us to be talking about the fact that First, you know, universal tuition free college may be the most supported, but it's also the least financially sustainable. And it also might help more uh, high income families than low income families. So we need to think, think about how we can most economically efficiently um, boost our overall levels of college access and affordability and who really needs that support. Um, and then second, really, you know, merit-based policies may be more popular, however, and, and you know, we may be more likely to allocate burdens to, to low-income families um, and less likely to folks we consider deserving. But what are the social equity implications there? Right? And I think that this balance between political feasibility and social equity needs to be a conversation that we're having both in the scholarship and among policymakers at the state level. And thank you so much for your time. I can't wait to see your questions. Yep, and as we transition to our next panelist, if you have questions, uh, there is a Q&A button um, where you see um, polling and some of the other kind of availability. So there's a chat and a Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can ask them now or you can ask them later. Dr. Bell, thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, reading the paper and listening to your uh, remarks are very helpful in terms of popular opinion and the variations in the type of design of these policies and that merit and deservingness really play such a critical role in naming the, the policy targets and eventually who gets the benefit of free college and tuition-free promise programs. And with that, we will kick it off to Leanna Hippolyte. So hello, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and at home if you're able to be. Um, as Dr. Felix mentioned, my name is Leanna Hippolyte and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Southern California. I've opted to not use um, a PowerPoint presentation for today and just hoping that we can have some uh, conversation. So please um, engage on social media, engage in the chat box, um, because I would love to hear your perspectives on some of these topics. So I'll be talking about uh, my paper with my co-author, Dr. Antar Chavakunda at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and the paper is titled Experiencing Financial Aid at a Historically White Institution, a Critical Race Analysis. And so to just offer a little bit of um, what brought me to wanting to understand more about 
um, financial aid, particularly from um, a race lens. I worked um, in the college access and success space. So I worked both at an education nonprofit, helping students at Boston Public Schools apply to college and also supporting them through college. Um, and then after getting my master's degree, I wanted to work in a school setting. So I actually worked as the Dean of College and Career Advising at a charter high school in the Boston area. And it was through both of these experiences that um, I learned what it meant to help students through a lot of very complicated financial aid forms. So I've done hundreds of FAFSAs and CSS profiles with young people um, and seeing kind of the look on their face when they just have all these questions in front of them and don't really know how to answer them um, is the inspiration for wanting to better understand how we can strengthen these systems, particularly for our racially minoritized students. So to talk a little bit about um, the paper, we really wanted to understand the relationship between race and financial aid, um, and particularly how it impacted students' views of themselves, their families, and their futures. Um, we wanted to examine how race and racism especially in connection to the racial wealth gap, um, were linked to the financial aid system. Um, and as a result of trying to understand that relationship, um, we found that financial aid is not just this procedural um, experience where students are filling out forms and there's an allocation of funds, but instead, particularly Black students because of the relationship to wealth and money and assumptions about what that means on a college campus, financial aid was actually influencing in a negative way um, their experiences on campus. And so a lot of the, the research that's been done in the space of financial aid naturally is uh, quantitative. And we wanted to um, understand kind of the qualitative implications of financial aid for students. So we did uh, interviews with 35 black undergraduates who were juniors and seniors at a particular selective historically white institution. Um, we opted to do interviews with juniors and seniors as they would have had multiple years of experience with the financial aid process at, at this institution. Um, and so we wanted to get their critical insights on what that had meant for them and their campus experiences. And we decided that we wanted to use critical race theory as kind of this guiding um, light and lens for the work that we we're doing. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware, but critical race theory comes out of the legal field and it's based on um, this debate that was happening about um, class being prioritized over race or always being separated and segmented from this idea of race. Um, and so CRT really prioritizes conversations and analysis of race and racism. And we also wanted to use Tom Shapiro's work um, about the racial wealth gap and its particular implications for African American students and people in the US context. And so ultimately what we found was that financial aid and race have very particular relationships with topics of stigma, labor, and wealth for students on college campuses. So the first element was that um, financial aid actually had this relationship to Black students on this campus as a racial stereotype and a microaggression. Um, so on the first piece, um, Black students felt as if other students on campus had this assumption that every Black student was on financial aid. Um, and the implications of this is that when um, events might happen on campus, perhaps negative events, and if it did happen to involve a Black student, um, Black students spoke about when they would read those things in um, the university paper and the ways that it was described, it was as if, um, if a Black student happened to be involved in an event, how could they do that when we're funding their education to attend this university? And students really internalized that um, about themselves and what it meant about their place on campus. Um, and it had implications for the fact that they felt as if um, 
there was this, this air among other students that uh, they were being funded by them and by the institution to be present on campus. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, many students took this on themselves. They started to also believe that that was the case, um, that their um, uh, same race peers were dependent on financial aid in, at, at the institution, even though there was a lot of um, economic variation within uh, the small but present black community um, at this particular historically white institution. Um, some students also had really critical understandings of why that potentially could be the case. So the fact that um, generations of um, wealth distribution favoring particularly um, the white population and other non-black populations in the U.S. contest as a result of policies and programs, um, a lot of students actually did understand that perhaps we do need more financial aid because of the ways that the racial wealth gap has perpetuated itself over time. Um, the other piece was this idea of labor. So we know that so many of our college students are very, very busy on campus, um, often overwhelmed um, by all of their commitments. And what we heard from students is that many of them were continuing to apply to scholarships and outside sources for financial support. Um, they wanted to make sure that they could help their parents whenever tuition bills came around. They wanted to have ways to address the, the impending student debt that they knew was kind of hanging over their shoulders as well as those of their families. And so they were spending a lot of time continuing to try to look for these additional resources for financial support. Um, and what this means is that while some other students may, able to, may be able to um, focus more on their academics, apply for internships, apply for research opportunities, that perhaps this is um, an additional barrier to Black students in particular in these kinds of situations if they're having to uh, spend more time continuing to try to figure out the financial aid process for themselves and their families. And the last element was related to wealth. Um, and so financial aid was also this factor that was kind of reinforcing this racial wealth divide. So um, students talked about the fact that whenever that tuition bill was about to be due, there was a uh, particular stress among them um, and their friends. Um, and that this had an impact on them as well. Many students talked about the fact that they were helping their parents to pay and address their tuition bills. And so while some other students and their peers were able to use the money that they had saved from working to perhaps travel or take advantage of other academic and professional opportunities, these students were really prioritizing and, and at many times feeling very anxious about the pressure to be able to afford their semester to semester tuition bills. Um, there was also uh, an assumption among students that they felt like they were responsible for any of the debt that they and their families had accrued related to higher education. And so um, we can imagine um, that students would know when they take out um, their state and federal loans that they would be responsible for paying that back. Um, but they also said that if their parents had to take out um, the Parent PLUS loan, which is a federal loan, particularly that is the responsibility of parents that can be used towards higher education, um, students in, in our sample said, no, that loan, since they took it out to help me and support me in school, that is also my loan. Um, and so there was a lot of ownership and wanting to alleviate as much as they could any um, stress and provide relief to their parents who have been supportive to them. Um, and so there are three particular implications for practice that uh, we hoped we could offer up to individuals who want to know, you know, what, is, what does this mean in terms of the experiences of our Black students with financial aid for how we move forward. So the first is just awareness. Um, so understanding that financial aid is not race neutral. Um, and the fact that uh, participants had all of these stressors, so both the stress that might come around when the tuition bill is due, um, trying to figure out how they're going to help their parents address that, as well as the racialized campus incidents and feeling like, 
oh gosh, I hope that it's not a black student. And if it is a black student, are students going to make these comments about, well, we're paying, the institution is paying for them to be here. They're on financial aid. And understanding that there is that uh, relationship in terms of how black students are experiencing their campus environments. And so the first piece is just for all of us who are working on college campuses or working and supporting college students that we're aware that this is a stressor for our young people, um, whether or not we work particularly in financial aid, but especially if we do and try to just have that um, uh, empathetic awareness for the fact that this is something um, that they're experiencing. Uh, the second piece and implication is that we should really beware of the financial literacy will save us argument. Um, there are a lot of ways where um, uh, there are assumptions about the fact that there are these wealth disparities and how did they come to be. Um, and so I think that often when we have conversations about financial literacy and its importance, which, which it does have a lot of importance and we have to make sure that that knowledge is being shared and uh, moving forward. But we also want to make sure that in those same ways we're having conversations about the structural reasons for why um, the wealth gap has is present and why it persists and, and is expanding. Um, and that's, you know, a result of policies like redlining and restrictive housing covenants and predatory lending. So um, many of these manifestations are not something of the past. They continue to happen. And when we're talking to our young people and even our peers about financial literacy, we have to make sure that it doesn't become um, a conversation about individual um, uh, differences and instead is also being linked to historical structures that have led us to this place. Um, the final implication uh, that we wanted to share with our work is that financial aid continues to be a means test in the United States. Um, and so as a college counselor, my students were always um, under the impression that if they you know, worked very hard um, and were able to get, gain access and be admitted to an institution that they would be able to go. Um, that is what we tell them. That is what they see on the television. That is what they read. That's what they hear. It's reinforced everywhere in our culture. Um, and yet, that is not the case, that even when our students are admitted to these institutions, um, they still often cannot afford to attend them. That is why they have to take out so much debt. Um, and it's a conversation um, that we need to have with our young people, that it's really not um, about them, but about these structures, both formal and informal, that limit access and, and make access much easier for wealthy people. Um, so we shouldn't expect that our students um, with the least financial resources are doing the most amount of work. And that is how we have structured our financial aid process. So not only are we telling um, young people who may be the first in their family to attend college, who have never seen these forms before, that they have to fill out these complicated forms, but we're adding additional forms to it. So we're telling students that not only do you have to do the FAFSA, the CSS profile, but you also have to do verification forms for every school that you've been admitted to. Um, and so it's those kinds of processes that I think we're using to continue to create additional barriers for something that is already so challenging, which is affording a college education. Um, so I think that I'll, I'll leave everyone with in terms of my remarks that we need to do what we can to reduce these barriers um, in the financial aid process. Um, and if there are, in the meantime, we're not able to reduce them, we need to at least create support systems um, that help students overcome them. So whether that's um, college counselors on the high school side, all of the nonprofits who are doing the work um, to support students in high school and college, as well as the administrators um, and leaders on college campuses who are also trying to fill in those gaps. Um, we need to make sure that that's prioritized for all of our students and particularly our racially minoritized students. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for your remarks, Dr. Hippolyte. After listening to it all, I had to put some respect on your name and already call you doctor. Uh, I think uh, this is a, a richly important study that uses qualitative and critical approaches, but also plays out a lot of what Dr. Bell mentioned in terms of public opinion around who deserves financial aid 
And unfortunately, the ways that black students perceive and are assumed to be reliant and dependent as policy targets and having to walk on campus, go to class and persist, um, always having the perceptions around campus that they are, uh, if not dependent, uh, potentially also deviant in social construction and still be successful on campus and beyond. And I think um, it also plays well into our next speaker, uh, Dr. Baker, talking about the student loan landscape and also you know, what the ramifications are for students after college. That is actually a perfect segue. Um, so I have set up my phone to hopefully uh, keep me on track here. Um, but I'm Dominique Baker. I'm an assistant professor of education policy at Southern Methodist University. Uh, and so I have uh, a fairly uh, a, a significant chunk of the research that I do focuses on um, student financial aid and in particular student loans. Um, so with that, um, I selected an article that uh, people are welcome to read. Uh, um, it is actually an article that's published in an open access journal. So anyone is welcome to read that article if they so choose. Um, uh, but uh, I picked that one as a, a good thing to go along with this. But what I'm going to try to do with my time is actually just talk a little bit about how we talk about affordability and in particular student loans broadly in the United States. Um, I think uh, often, um, I, I think we've had like two really great dives into research. And so I just want to take a little bit of time um, instead of diving into one of my papers and sort of just talk broadly about what we think about with affordability. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so unless otherwise noted, any of these figures come from the College Board's trends um, in student aid. Uh, you are welcome. There's tons of really rich information uh, that are, is in this annual report that comes uh, from uh, researchers at the College Board. So I highly recommend if you have any interest in student financial aid um, that you check that out anytime uh, it's coming out. Next one. Uh, so first off, um, I just wanted us to sort of think broadly about what federal borrowing has looked like over time, uh, because we often talk a lot about increases, other things like that, but we don't always have a clear perspective on what trends look like. Uh, advance. So uh, the first part up here is what we're often thinking about when we talk about student aid. And that is uh, loans that go directly to students that are either subsidized or unsubsidized. So it's whether or not uh, they're accruing interest while the student is enrolled in college. And what you can sort of see is we go from orange to blue uh, for time. So the darkest orange is the 0304 academic year. And then the lightest blue is the 1819 academic year. And what you can see is actually generally speaking, um, the sort of average annual borrowing per, per borrower has not shifted that that much uh, when we're talking about these direct loans going to students. Advance. Um, the area that, thank you, the area that we see a large amount of growth is actually when we talk about the suite of loans known as PLUS loans. So um, this is a part that was just talked about when we talk about parent PLUS loans. Uh, so uh, funding that parents can take out in order to help support a child going to college, um, as well as graduate plus loans, which is how the majority of graduate students finance uh, through loans uh, their, their uh, experiences, their, their graduate school. And so what you can see is that there have been uh, changes, uh, uh, significant increases uh, per borrower when we talk about plus loans. So this is one of the primary reasons that anytime we try to talk about debt relief, when we try to talk about the types of payments that need to be paused, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about the current scenario when we get to our moderated point. Um, this is one of the reasons why we, all, we, we always want to also think about PLUS loans uh, is because the burden that we are often talking about when we think about high uh, amounts, high cumulative uh, or average amounts, uh, we're often talking about plus loans and debt that was used to finance a graduate school education. Uh, so that's an important piece that I always want to bring up. Uh, next slide. So then um, the second piece to this is uh, whenever I do research, I'm always trying to think about who borrows, how much do they borrow, where do they attend? Uh, and I'm always particularly interested in where is heterogeneity? Where is the story not always the same? Can you advance one? 
And that, uh, this is one example of that. So I've pulled a figure that looks at the cumulative debt of bachelor's degree recipients, and it's broken out by race, ethnicity. And what I want you to notice, this is part of the reason uh, why often when you hear people talk about student financial aid and student debt, um, there is a key focus on black individuals. Uh, and that's because you, you can sort of look and see um, just how many uh, black students borrow and that they borrow um, significantly larger amounts than their peers. This is consistent. Uh, uh, this is not something that's odd about the 15-16 year. Uh, th this is, this is a, a, a consistent, unfortunate truism of what we know about student loan debt. And this ties in um, to what Leanne was already talking about around um, sort of racial wealth gaps uh, and a number of other systemic structures that make it so that black individuals uh, and their families rely on student loans at a much higher rate than their peers. And so this is why uh, you sort of see a very stark difference when we look across degree recipients with how much they borrowed uh, when we look across race. Can we advance forward? And this is also true even if we break it apart by income. So this is not from the College Board. This is from the Urban Institute. Uh, so Matt Chingos did an analysis where he said, what if we break apart family income quintiles? So those are down across the bottom, the x-axis. Uh, and then we saw how much students borrow uh, based on their family's income. And what you can see is regardless, along the income spectrum, we still see that black students are borrowing at the highest rate compared to, to their peers who are, are white or uh, Hispanic, which um, is the uh, distinctions that the data uses uh, that Matt analyzed. Um, and, and part of this as well is, is one of these sort of um, big key factors that we don't talk about enough that income and wealth are not the same thing. We've talked a lot about wealth today. And so one of the critical pieces to keep in mind um, is that uh, we often think about income because it is easier to measure and we often have uh, easier access to measures of income than we do measures of wealth. But when we're thinking about who has access to extra money to be able to pay for college, um, we want to be thinking about wealth, um, savings, retirement, investments, all those sorts of pieces that add into um, sort of the economic stability of a family. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that you can sort of see that regardless of the uh, family income, uh, Black students are still borrowing at higher rates than others. Uh, and so I give these uh, examples to show, uh, similar to a theme that's already been said, that there are very real uh, racial disproportionalities uh, when it comes to student loans. Uh, Black students borrow at the highest rates and the highest amounts. Um, and that this is not because of some innate uh, desire of Black families to want to rely on student loans. Uh, this is in large part based on uh, uh, the systemic ways that public policy uh, for decades, centuries, uh, has, has pushed um, to uh, not allow for wealth accrual within Black families, uh, which means that those Black families then must rely on student loans if they want to gain access to the benefits that come from having uh, a college degree. Uh, advance. So then the other uh, major takeaway that I try to make sure people leave anytime I talk about student debt is a better understanding of who has debt and how much debt do they have. We will often hear people talk a lot about uh, people having over $200,000 in debt, over $100,000 in debt. Uh, and it is critical that people keep in mind uh, how, what the actual distribution of who has debt looks like in the United States. Can you go forward? So for this um, graphic, I'm going to just explain this first one in the red right now. So this is for individuals who have less than $5,000 in outstanding debt. The blue bar is the percentage of borrowers. So 17% of borrowers have less than $5,000 in debt. And that less than $5,000, whatever the amount is those borrowers have, that is a, approximately 1% of all of the outstanding debt in the United States. So that means that 17% of borrowers have approximately 1% of the debt. Can you advance to the next one? So then let's pull that out just a little bit further. Um, oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, live, live on the edge PowerPoint. Uh, so uh, generally speaking, if we look at these first three sections, that's 
individuals who have less than $20,000 in outstanding debt. That's actually 55% of all borrowers. So over half of all borrowers have less than $20,000 in debt. Uh, as far as the sort of, if you look at how much student loan debt there is in the United States. Uh, this is this is huge. This is part of the reason why uh, a lot of the times when we hear about debt relief packages or people focus on debt relief, they are looking at what could we do for people with less than $10,000 of debt or less than $20,000 of debt. Because if you do something at less than $20,000 of debt, you're actually covering 55% of all borrowers in the United States. If you do something with less than $10,000 of debt, you're actually covering 34% of all borrowers in the United States. Can you advance? Now, this is different than if we go and we think about uh, individuals with a significant amount of debt. So um, what we know is that uh, if you're looking at $200,000 or more in debt, Actually, only 2% of all borrowers have this much debt, but it covers 15% of all of the outstanding debt in the United States. So a very small number of borrowers have a significant share of all of the student loan debt in the United States. And advance one more time. And if you think about this even further, 43% um, of all of the outstanding debt, uh, that's $80,000 or more debt, uh, that's held by 10% of borrowers in the United States. So 10% of borrowers have roughly 43%, close to half of all of the outstanding debt in the United States. So these are critical things that we always have to keep in mind when we're thinking about um, how, do we, how do we do relief? How do we think about pausing payments? What does this look like? Um, and, and, and what is the debt burden that people hold? Uh, is that a, a major truism is that a majority of borrowers in the United States have, have fairly small outstanding average balances. Um, and a very small portion of borrowers in the United States have an outsized amount of their, of their debt. And that can be from things like going to graduate school, et cetera, et cetera. Can we advance? Um, and then uh, we haven't really talked as much about sort of repayment around student loans. We've talked a lot about how students process financial aid within higher education, how much they borrow. And so I just want to wrap up really quickly with talking about repayment, um, because for a lot of people, when you talk uh, to policymakers, to um, uh, policy advocates, uh, a lot of concern around student loans is actually around repayment. And, and it's this really piece around are you able to manage the payments that you have to pay off your student debt? Uh, and so when we talk about who struggles the most with that repayment, uh, when we talk, we often sort of the number one place that people go to is by balance or completion. So generally speaking, more than half of borrowers had less than $10,000 in debt when they defaulted. Uh, when, they, uh, when the government said, you've missed a certain number of payments, we're concerned about whether or not you're gonna be able to pay this debt off. That's default broadly defined. Um, and two thirds of all defaulters did not complete a degree or certificate program. We largely say this is because you took out the debt, you, you borrowed the money, um, but you didn't get that boost from completing your degree or certificate program. And so because of that, you're struggling with repayment, you default on your loans. We generally speaking in a lot of policy conversations have focused really strongly on if you can get students to complete they're way, way, way more likely to be able to actually uh, uh, manage their defaults, uh, to, to be able to manage their student loan payments. Um, and that is generally too, true for most student groups, except, can we advance? The advance the slide, perfect, by race. So um, a, a key piece here, we, we've talked a lot about, oh, if you complete, you can, if you get them to complete, they'll be able to afford. Um, that's true for most students. However, uh, black bachelor's degree graduates actually default at roughly five times the rate of white bachelor's degree graduates. And in fact, um, black bachelor's degree graduates are more likely to default, they are more likely to struggle in repaying their loans than white students who drop out of college. And that's huge. Because that means that the black students who have completed their bachelor's degree, who should be getting the benefits from earning that degree, are more likely to struggle on repayment than white students who got the debt and then dropped out. Uh, and and, and that, that matters, because that means that this is not just about completion, that there is something that is happening here where black students um, are struggling to be able to repay, even when they earn a bachelor's degree. 
So, so the, the two big takeaways from my part is around um, how we think about the distribution of debt. Uh, and that's thinking about uh, the fact that plus loans are driving most of our, our, our growth and, and thinking through um, who has uh, large versus small balances. And this racialized piece here around the fact that even when black students do what they're supposed to do, they're still not benefiting from their degrees in the way that white students would. Uh, and so we have to keep that in mind when we think about what student loans look like and what repayment looks like in the United States. And then for my final slide, um, the other big piece to this is that um, students who attend for-profit and community college uh, uh, colleges and borrow um, default at higher rates, though uh, student loan defaults are concentrated among students who are attending within the for-profit sector. Uh, I always put a plug that you, um, I highly recommend if you want to better understand sort of student loans, student financial aid, and the for-profit sector, um, that uh, Laura Ed by Tristan McMillan Cottom is an excellent book that looks at this uh, and, and sort of teases out how the system has been designed. Uh, the, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, in some ways, the system is working the way it was designed to. Uh, and so to sort of create solutions and find better ways of doing things, we have to think from a systemic nature. So I'll stop there uh, and look forward to chatting with people as we do Q&A. Thank you. Awesome. I was, uh, I was trying not to clap and cheer uh, on screen, but thank you so much for not just your remarks, but as um, some of the chats say, it's just a striking piece of data, right? Um, that's alarming that you know, we need to be more proactive in our policies and the ways that they target the most vulnerable groups, right? Um, and the last two uh, panelists have shared the importance of thinking about black students both as they um, persist through college, but also what it means after um, and why the default rates are so high. And if I think I remember your last slide, five times more likely to default um, than their white peers. And that is um, unacceptable from a policy perspective. And uh, let's see how we can get some alternatives and some advocates to continue to push for uh, more loan relief as we start to see that policymakers are open to relief bills for certain sectors and certain um, stakeholders, right? And as Dr. Bell mentioned, those are probably the ones that are constructed as advantageous or the ones that are deemed deserving of these $2 trillion that are about to be passed in the House. Uh, with that, I want to go into a panel discussion. We have um, four questions. I also want to thank the participants for being within time. So we're actually five minutes ahead of my schedule, which is amazing. Thank you all so much. If there are additional questions, please ask them after this panel discussion. We will try to answer as many of them as possible. And again, our wrap up time is 1130. So the first question for the group is just, again, given the impact of the public health crisis and the pandemic, both on our national economy and state budgets. I know working at the Cal State system, we've gotten a variety of memos about hiring slowdowns and about limiting capital expenses moving forward. So I'm just wondering how your work, how your research, your insight speaks to the potential implications on affordability policies and student loans as well. And anyone can jump off. Hello. So there are just a couple of moving parts uh, here, especially thinking about state budgets. So I, I study state budgets. I can't speak to the national economy, but I can speak to the state budgets for sure. And right now what we're doing is looking back to the Great Recession and seeing how that impacted universities and how universities responded. And what's interesting now is that they're not going to be able to respond the same way. So what we saw after the Great Recession was a lot of universities raising tuition, right? But a lot of states have actually engaged in tuition freezes, right? So they're not gonna be able to, to capture that extra revenue. So alternatives that I've seen um, from a survey that Inside Higher Ed did that I was just reading this morning, alternatives are basically uh, cut administration and staffing, uh, rely more on part-time non-tenure track faculty and changes in faculty hires. So hiring freezes at Miami is definitely already being implemented. So those are some of the re responses. But more generally, thinking about 
just how state policymakers may respond is they're going to have a huge recession to deal with, right? And the unfortunate part of higher education state budgets is that <laughs> when it comes to uh, cutting, higher education is where they're going to cut. Uh, and this is for a variety of political reasons. The first political reason is that whenever they're thinking about cutting education, it's not going to be K-12 because K-12 can't uh, raise their own revenues, right? They don't have an endowment. They don't have the ability to, in, they can pass local um, tax increases and in those sorts of things, but not in all of the parts of the state. So very often higher education is disproportionately cut uh, at the state level. Also, in addition to that, there's um, thinking about just even our universities right now, tuition rates are locked in right now. So they actually can't move them for next year, even though they're having to refund room and board. They're having to cancel all study abroad programs. They're having to not allow uh, potentially international students who are coming from other countries to actually come in in the fall, which it, at Miami is a huge deal because we have a ton of students from China that actually pay a really high tuition rate to come and um, learn at our university. So that's another issue that we're gonna be facing. I think we're also gonna see a lot of universities closing um, and more students without a job. And so what that means is they'll basically, what we see at the, the Great Recession at least is that more people are attending college so that actually could be a bright side. We need a bright side right now, <laughs> potentially, right? Uh, we could see more re-entry into colleges and universities, which would be a good thing for um, universities that are really struggling to get more students. And, and go ahead, anybody else? I think you did great. Dr. Um, or right, Leanna, all right. I was just thinking a little bit, I mean, most of my research takes the perspective of student voice in some of these processes. Um, and even in my personal college counseling work in the last few years, I've had to advise students through their colleges closing um, for some of the smaller colleges on the Northeast. So that's been really challenging for students. And I imagine as that ramps up that that's going to be um, something that just feels very uncertain at these times when students are dealing with that in their personal lives as well. So I just want to offer up a few things I think would be useful in terms of the university side. They need to have really clear communication with young people right now about what is happening. I think um, a lot of like the social media has been used to gain excitement about being admitted or coming in the fall, um, but it needs to actually be about information sharing as well, um, letting students Students know what deadlines are coming up, um, if there's any flexibility. I really encourage universities to the extent that they can to be flexible with deadlines, especially for students who are racially minoritized students, low income students, first generation to college students. Um, and I would tell on the students uh, and as well as their support teams on the high school side, um, to have a plan and a backup plan um, that you just, there are so many things that are in flux and that are changing. Um, and so to the extent that they can um, uh, have these plans in comparison to other years where that wouldn't have been the case um, is probably what needs to happen at this time. And it seems like because you popped them up, you want us to start potentially going into some of the other questions as well. So I was trying to unmute myself with the space bar and it actually advanced the, the <laughs> I figured now that they're out there, they might as well stay. And if there are any that speak to you or you feel that you can speak to, then yeah, I'll give you that opportunity. Sure. Okay. So um, I'll actually, I'll dovetail off of that and go to the next question, which is sort of um, what can institutions do to be more proactive in supporting students in Merge aid? And so we're just talking a little bit right about um, be more flexible and those sorts of pieces. So I think this actually dovetails a little bit with the $2 trillion relief bill that the House has just passed. Um, uh, while, while we're doing this, you know, policy is always happening. Um, so one of, the, one of the big pieces in there that I give, you know, complete credit and um, support um, to Senator Patty Murray for is um, this is like really policy wonky, uh, but the federal government actually uh, has now, well, Patty Murray made sure that uh, was put into this bill, um, removes a number of administrative burdens to allow institutions to repurpose some of their federal funds to create emergency aid for students. Um, and so I think more things like this have to happen. So like much love and support. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for putting that in there because it's a, it's a thing that if you don't know 
all the ins and the outs of the policy, you might not realize that for certain types of aid, there's all these sorts of additional pieces of deservingness and worthiness that we've been talking about today um, that institutions have to uh, uh, sort of jump through those hoops before they're allowed to give out money. And so by creating these types of uh, policy changes at the federal level, institutions have much more flexibility to try to get emergency aid into the hands of students who, right, are trying to get plane tickets within a week's notice to get home. Um, I, I, I give full credit to the fact that I, in, institutions were not prepared for, for what this would be. We are all dealing with something that we uh, did not necessarily think definitely uh, last year this time, right, did not think that this would be a thing that institutions would be dealing with at the country, the world would be dealing with. Um, but we do also have to keep in mind that for a number of students, so, so I want to give credit, like, I'm not here to, like, you know, yell at college and universities right now. Um, but it is also the case that students were often told with very little notice um, that they had to make changes that they needed to be able to uh, go home um, for spring break, but also bring all of their books just in case their school's not open again and all, all, all sorts of pieces. Um, and, and, and so with that, I know, right, like as an alum of the University of Virginia, um, uh, we created a fund that was similar to many other universities funds um, that was about community members, students and alumni donating money to get to students so that they can try to deal with with getting home. Um, and 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 part of I guess one of my major takeaways for this beyond the fact that like I think the ways that the federal government and states can try to as much as possible create flexibility uh, has to happen. Um, but like we are going to see uh, a very real bifurcation of the effects of this. So there will be institutions um, like the Harvards of the world that get to choose what they do uh, with their endowment, right? They they've made some choices where they didn't spend it, uh, um, but there are institutions that have that option or institutions like my alma mater UVA who had the option to contact alumni and say, can you donate money so we can try to help students get home um, in a way that not all institutions ha have that. They don't all have that resource, that capacity to be able to tap into. Um, and so I am, am, am particularly concerned for the fact that uh, regional public institutions, um, small privates, that those are the institutions that are not necessarily going to have a second lifeline. Um, and, and what does that mean as we think about what Elizabeth said around the fact that generally in recessions, uh, we see a spike in students enrolling in higher education. So does that mean that there's potential that we're going to have a spike in demand at the same time that we actually don't know that we have the capacity to help those students? Who, who gets left out when we have a spike in demand, but we don't have capacity, right? Um, often the people that need it the most. Uh, so so I, I think those are some of the things that I really think about when, when I'm wondering um, how can institutions be more proactive and who do I think winds up getting affected uh, sort of the most by this. Um, and then my last thing, and then somebody else should definitely talk, um, is when I think about my thoughts uh, about the sort of CARES Act, one of the big things that I always want to make sure I bring up is um, we're not talking about all student loans when we talk about the different pieces of uh, interest waivers of, of six months, um, of pausing your payments, we're not talking about private loans. Um, and certain federal loans, Perkins is an example, are not included either. Um, and so messaging becomes critical because if all we're saying is, you got loans, six months, you don't have to worry about payments. That's not true. Um, and, and so it, you have to be, you have to be really specific about your messaging and you, you may need to think, not may like you have to think what, what so what does this mean for people with private loans uh, uh the the house's bill i believe um originally proposed also including private loans um obviously that may need to happen in a phase four package of some sort um but but student loans are not just the loans that are covered in the cares act uh and so people will be affected their liquidity will be affected if we don't think about those loans as well Thank you so much. Other panelists? Um, I would just add that uh, some of my other 
um, work is around Black cultural centers. And so I also want to emphasize at this time, um, making sure that we're supporting these spaces because we still have on many college campuses students who needed to remain on campus for emergency situations. Um, and so when I think about emergency relief and emergency supports, I want to be cognizant of our students who are still on campus, also, also mindful of the students who are back home and in needs of lots of supports because they're just confused on what's happening. Um, and I mentioned the cultural centers as potential avenues for ways to get information to students um, if these are spaces and, and relationships that students already had with administrators on campus. Um, Perhaps they can be the ones to reach out and, and do some kind of a needs assessment that's a little bit more thoughtful um, that can say, you know, because we have this relationship, like, what do you need? Because we do have something, you know, a, among many students and particularly racially minoritized students were asking for help is, is can be a challenge for many different reasons. Um, and so I want to also suggest that maybe our college campuses can um, uh, build upon these relationships that students already have with particular administration uh, administrators and spaces on campus and use that to get a sense for what students need at this time. So to build on what Dominique was saying really quick based on this survey that was conducted by inside higher ed um, 180 university presidents. So one of the number one things that they talk about is the need for flexibility on regulatory limitations. So let me give you an example. First, uh, a lot of universities are thinking about moving to credit, no credit this semester, right? They haven't even thought about the fact that GI Bill students won't get reimbursed for that. If they provide all credit, non-credit, then the regulations as it stands right now all of our veteran students would then have to foot the bill for their tuition. So we really need to be thinking about how all of these regulations need to be waived for this semester and potentially moving forward, having more flexibility as well. And all the university presidents, Dominique, they're saying the same thing that you are. They, are, they definitely need that flexibility. And in addition to that, the other thing that they said is they need financial stimulus package to basically compensate for their losses. Um, one of the things that they were really concerned about adding to the student perspective was mental health additionally. So asking for more uh, support for student mental health on campus and having these spaces where students feel safe is incredibly important and that is should be part of the conversation as well just another uh, building on i love i love all these side questions in the cares act who does it benefit who is left out so uh, a little bit more on the politics here uh, as you can see the democrats in the house are trying to do some symbolic moves so they're introducing bills that they know are never going to get passed right one of these bills is uh, on loan cancellation so just it was uh, was it 10 grand or, or 30 grand of student loan debt that they wanted to basically cancel. And if we think back to the Dominique slides, who would this impact, right? This would do a huge deal to impact people who are struggling to, to repay their, their loans, right? Um, and, and it just, uh, it's not going to pass, if anybody was wondering. It's not going to happen. But um, there are some political battles happening over student loan debt. But right now, we basically have deferment, which Ultimately, it's uncertain whether that's really going to do much, right? I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that as well, whether just deferring payments on only a small a, a subset of loans is actually going to um, provide the relief that students need who are now unemployed potentially. Yeah, I mean, I at least I think um, I, I so I was talking to someone recently about this and my biggest sort of takeaway was Deferment is the base level of what has to happen, right? Like, uh, uh, if 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 we don't want the wheels to fall off this bad boy, which who knows? Apparently, some people do. But if if we don't, if if, if we're just trying base level to help people, the least we got to do is pause payments for for everybody for for all our student loans. I I think that's also true for mortgages. I think right, like I, I think for consumer finance packages. We have to be thinking about rent pauses. We have to be thinking that money should not be going out to, to any of those types of, of financial products. Um, and people shouldn't be worrying that they're gonna be kicked out or utilities are gonna be turned off, things like that. And, and, and so similarly, at the bare minimum, we, we have to make sure that we have paused payments on student loans. Um, 
do, do I think that that will matter? Yes. If we couple it right with with um, significant payouts to to actual individuals. Uh, so particularly thinking around the fact that um, uh, right now we have a one time payment that's going out to individuals that needs to be a, a routine every month payment that's going out um, that we're thinking um, really critically about the potential, right? I, I think it's still being decided, but how we get that money out to people matters a ton. Um, because if we're talking about the fact that we just give money out to people who have direct deposits um, tied to uh, when they file their taxes, uh, we can again think about who does that, who are we helping and how quickly are we helping them? Um, so yeah, I, 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 think, I, think, I think that it is, it is not nothing to pause payments. I, 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 wanna, I wanna say that. Um, but I do think it has to be paused for all types of financial products, uh, credit cards, right? Interest shouldn't be accruing um, credit cards. Um, and I, I then think what we get start getting into, which we do not do a good enough job doing research on, is what are the psychological effects of having debt hanging over you? And what does it potentially mean to have that debt removed, right? We, we um, I, I was just at the, uh, the National Sort of Education Policy Conference, AEFP, and one of the things uh, in one of my sessions that we were talking about, right, is the fact that often when we do a lot of education policy research, um, education, right, is not a specific discipline. It is an interdisciplinary field that is a mixture of economics and sociology and political science and supposedly psychology, right? But like when we talk about education policy, we often do not factor in as much around psychology. We don't talk as much about um, um, all of those pieces around mental health and all these and all this. And so I don't think that we have very good research um, uh, uh, from a from a large body of research, right? Like so, some of the work that um, Leanne's doing, uh, right? Um, uh, one of uh, my pieces is uh, where I interview Black students as they're in the repayment process, right? And trying to understand that. Pew um, has done, Pew Charitable Trust has done a really great job of doing focus groups and interviews of talking to people as they're going through repayment. So we're starting to build this a bit, but we do not have a good conception of where the psychological pieces are around this type of, of student loan debt and what it might mean for people to have that removed. Whether or not that is a way that we could sort of jumpstart our economy um, is, is an unanswered question, I think. Thank you all so much. So as we move into the last 15 minutes of our webinar, again, I want to allow the participants to use the Q&A and ask any questions. I'll start to also pose questions to our panelists. Uh, Leanna, there was a question about that's moved on me, but there was a question about if students' perceptions of financial aid change over the course of their college career. So as they move from junior to senior, potentially, that's one of the questions asked. And if you could provide remarks, uh, sure, I'll be brief with that. I think um, as students moved further along in their experience and closer to graduation, there were a lot of conversations in the data about graduate school. Um, you know, this is a selective institution. And so many students have that on their mind as part of their plan. And we're talking about whether that might be immediately after or not. And of course, um, student loans uh, come into that. And so a big um, part of what we saw was that many students were talking about the fact that perhaps, like I said, it was a very mixed income group in terms of the black student participants that we spoke to. And so some of them said that, um, um, you know, they were able to work with their parents to figure out their undergraduate degree and how they would pay bill by bill, um, or they were lucky enough to be able to have enough adequate support from their parents for undergrad, but that grad school was like a whole other beast, and I think that that was very much tied to the wealth conversation. Um, that their parents had, you know, some of that income in order to be able to support them through the, the first four years. But beyond that, especially for the individuals thinking about um, doctorate degrees or medical degrees, um, that that became um, something that they knew was less feasible, was more of a responsibility for them, and that there were fewer options. So again, students talked about how they were looking into scholarship and potential funding opportunities at length. Um, and so I, I think what really came out of that in terms of the transition was that students were thinking in the future and were feeling even more overwhelmed by um, the prospect of not having as many 
um, federal and state financial resources that could support them with that next part of their trajectory. Thank you. And Dr. Baker, there was a question related to if uh, you've seen or noticed that racially minoritized students have higher borrowing rates at four-year institutions that seem to be perceived as more accessible, broad access, and affordable? Yeah, so um, a lot of the research, like when I was talking about where our defaults concentrated, right, um, well, that's sort of looking at the entire landscape of higher education. That's including um, publics, not-for-profit privates, and for-profit privates, and all along a uh, four-year, two-year, less than two-year. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, you're going to get this really interesting, I believe vacuuming is happening right outside my door. Um, so if that happens in the background, enjoy. Um, but, but so um, one of the, the sort of critical pieces is, is that a lot when it comes to student financial aid is a both and situation. So it's that we see that um, people struggle to repay their loans um, from, uh, that, uh, for students that attended for profits uh, or uh, who attended community colleges. And we see that black students struggle to repay um, on average uh, regardless of which sector we're talking about. And we see that students who don't complete are more, so right, so it's it's all of these additional layers of nuance around um, who struggles. And so it's one of the reasons I, I try as much as possible not to break down um, who struggles into just like a single, like it's people that don't complete. And if you fix that, you fix the whole problem. Because it's just, it's, it's not the case. We are a varied and nuanced people, right? And so because of that, uh, we are also have uh, varied and nuanced ways of interacting with the student loan process and, and student financial aid broadly as well. Um, so yeah, there, there are, are definitely people that struggle at four-year institutions. And, and for some four-year institutions, one of the biggest issues uh, for a select number of four-year institutions is actually that they are incredibly affordable um, and they do a terrible job of making that clear to students because it's back end after they've already applied uh, uh, grants and things like that that go out. A really great study um, from the University of Michigan uh, that uh, Sue Dynarski uh, headed up uh, looked at what happened when students were sent literature before they ever applied to college to say, hey, did you know that if you uh, go to the University of Michigan, you go for free? Um, and it completely, uh, it really helped to revamp um, the, the students that were applying and the students that were admitted um, to the University of Michigan. Um, so a lot of uh, parts of issues around affordability when it comes to certain types of four-year institutions can be about um, misperceptions and the fact that those institutions don't necessarily always do the best job with letting families know uh, what they can do for them. Thank you so much. I think as we wrap up and move into our final thoughts, there is so much uncertainty and there is a lot of opportunity in the chaos to maybe envision new things or leverage into new possibilities. So, as a final thought, you know, my question was, what kind of policies do we need to maybe imagine or reimagine and design to try to work towards uh, educational equity? Maybe start with Dr. Bell. So building on what we've been talking about this whole panel, actually, I think one of the things that we could do is actually follow the lead of studies like Sue Dynarski and all of these behavioral science studies on the importance of reaching out to students um, before college actually is happening, right? So potentially first, automatically giving need-based aid to eligible students, right? We already have income information through the IRS. We already have income information at the state level even. If we leverage administrative data that's already existing and we send out these letters showing students what they're eligible for, this could seriously change the conversation about college access and affordability among the students who need help the most. So that's one thing. I think also for the federal Pell Grant, I think even before they fill out the FAFSA, if we, we have information from the IRS, send these students um, a notification of what they're eligible for. So that's the first thing. Make sure that they have access and they know about what they're eligible for before college. I think second, we need to simplify the application processes. I think we need to reduce the administrative burdens in these application processes, both for merit-based, need-based, and free college programs. Uh, even the FAFSA itself, I would argue, needs to be simplified. And I think a lot of people in Congress are trying to work on this right now. Um, third, I think that we need to restore the purchasing power of the Pell Grant. 
uh, we know that the Pell Grant does not buy as much as it used to. And really we should keep the Pell Grant adjusted with inflation to keep it basically at this level where it does provide low income students with a substantial grant that helps them access college. I would also say, um, I, I would, uh, would love to see expanding public service loan forgiveness and reducing uh, burden in that program to revitalize our public sector uh, and get students into great careers in the public sector. And then finally, I think the most pie in the sky um, policy that I would love to see is really a grant program focused on the racial wealth gap. So tailoring grant funding specifically to students that are ineligible for means tested uh, programs based on their income, right? But that have been affected by racist structures over time, which has prevented their family from accumulating wealth, right? So essentially having a grant program that would address the racial wealth gap would be amazing. Thank you. Leanna? Um, I, I mean, so many things that Dr. Bell just shared. I, if you can tell from my nodding, um, I agree with wholeheartedly. So I think that if those things were to happen, many of my dreams would come true related to financial aid for our students. Um, I think uh, a part that I'll take out of that that has been really salient for me is just this commitment to equity, not just as a word, but actually in our policies. So part of the CARE Act, though a small segment comparatively is for education, um, for some higher ed institutions that are serving more Pell uh, recipients, they're able to get more funding. And I think those kinds of structures that we can put into our policies will be most helpful for our students who need the most help. Um, sometimes when we just do these blanket policies, um, it ends up just keeping the same uh, divides among students. Um, so I would say that commitment to equity is really important. Um, and at this time, I mean, the core of a lot of my research is that you know, relationships are really key. Um, and we know that that's true for policy and politics and how things actually come to fruition. But um, I think to the extent that we can continue to develop um, understanding of what our students and our practitioners on the ground are experiencing and using that to really create and figure out to what extent our policies are working or not um, should be a continued priority. Um, but yeah, I agree with simplifying forms, making sure that students um, have support. Our ratios for guidance counselors to students is pretty awful across the nation and particularly in California. Um, and this is a time where, you know, our students need support, need someone that they can go to both on the high school level and on the college side. So hoping that we can do what, our, what we can to center our students when we're making decisions at this time. Um, and again, uh, just making sure we're oriented towards equity um, rather than equality. Thank you so much. And Dr. Baker? Yeah, so no, I think um, I'm trying not to repeat any of the other things, right? Uh, so it happens when you go last. Um, so so I, I would say one of, one of my biggest um, concerns as we go into this is not, you might not all, all like off the top think about it, but it is um, sort of accountability of institutions. And, and what I mean by that is um, we, we have to be careful as we create all of these additional, as we're trying to think through, what does it mean to, uh, well, hey, right, like, so institutions need money. Students need money. The federal government has to figure out ways to help. I think, uh, um, I think we need to be talking about New Deal style, um, except actually open to everyone um, and, and instead of not, uh, uh, but that we, we need some sort of New Deal style uh, revitalization across the board. Um, uh, for, for a lot of these pieces. And I think colleges could have an interesting role to play with that. I think there are a lot of colleges and universities, right, that have um, um, engineering and maker spaces and all sorts of pieces that are, right, like diving in to try to help with building parts for ventilators. I think that there are ways that we could create and systematize that. This is not going away. Like, I, I personally don't think we'll probably be on campus in the fall. Um, who knows? I, I, I I would not be shocked. Um, um, yes, okay, so someone just said a, a new deal, uh, but without all this systematic racism, and that's exactly what I was, yeah, going for. That's what all of my face was doing, right? Um, so so um, 
I think that there are ways that we could think from a systematic standpoint, how can we help institutions um, to, to be helping to serve the nation um, while also helping them with funding um, and, and helping students to have a place to go and all, all sorts of pieces. I, I think we have to be thinking very big about this um, and institutions thinking about ways to try to help people who were not even like their traditional students, right? Um, this, is, this is about sort of how we, we help our country uh, and, and help all among us um, to, to survive. Um, so, so, so that's like sort of my, my big piece, but I, I think that you can't do that without also thinking about accountability, um, that if we just uh, pump a lot of money to, to places that are not helpful, um, that are not trying to help students, that are here to shore up their money, right? This is sort of, you can think uh, like uh, the buybacks of companies, right? That we have to think about what are the ways that we make sure that companies don't take money from the federal government and then just enrich themselves without actually putting anything into the country. Similarly, we have to think about what does it mean to make sure that institutions are taking this money in and then helping people that need the help um, without right, increasing so much of the administrative burden that then institutions uh, uh, have nothing that they can do. right? Um, and I think that requires good relationship building between governmental uh, affairs staff at colleges and universities um, or at system levels uh, and what that looks like with both their state and the federal government. And, so I, I'll sort of end this with, I think one of the biggest things that has to happen is that we need a strong federal response. Um, because right now we're creating a lot of mini responses across the 50 states, across DC, which is uh, right um, treated as a territory within um, the latest bill, which means that they don't get the same uh, help, but they have citizens that live there. They have uh, colleges and universities. So what, what does that mean as well? Uh, so I think all of those different pieces um, mean that we, we have to have strong direction from the federal government about how we move forward um, to like survive as people. Um, yeah. I'm going to just forward this, uh, this video and this section to uh, the legislative staffers that I know, both in California and DC. Uh, it's, it's truly been an amazing opportunity to connect with all of you and to just listen to uh, your research and your articles come to life through your remarks, through your insight. Um, and for the most part, just trying to build community, uh, allowing for you to spend part of your Friday morning or afternoon with us in this uh, first of four series for the community forum. So I can't thank you enough. For those of you that are still on the webinar, it'd be a good opportunity to screenshot if you are interested in continuing the discussion, either emailing our panelists for more insight on their work or connecting with them via social media. Uh, and the last thing I wanna share is our next webinar is on internationalization and higher education, which I think the date will be April 10th. What time, I'm not sure if you're still here in the chat. I created a uh, registration link so you can register and that would be great. Again, just from, I just can't appreciate uh, your time, your feedback, and all of your amazing insight on how we can make higher education society and our world better. So again, thank you for living out um, the need for us to be more compassionate, more caring, and building community. Thank you for your time, and we are signing off. Take care. Thank you, Eric.